Sounds like the mic's working. Oh, there's a first for everything, isn't there? <laughs> if I turn it on, turn it off, wonder if I've got it right. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad you're here. It's a beautiful day. It's a wonderful day to be not just in the sunshine of life, but in the sunshine of God's grace and glory. Well, two weeks ago, I wrapped up that series on living the balanced life, remember? And we talked about that, uh, well, just to rehearse real quick, Christ is the center, the wheel is obedience to Christ, the foundation is the word of God, prayer is our response to God that keeps Christ centered in our life, we have the right hand of fellowship, and that's our relationship with other believers, and on the left there was witnessing, sharing the love of Jesus with those that don't know, yet know Christ. And I, last week we talked about, you know, God moving the stone away so that we could see his glory and grace. And the first thing that the disciples did, anyone that encountered the risen Christ, their response was to go and tell others. And of course, on that first Easter, when Jesus popped into the midst where the disciples were locked in the room, Thomas wasn't with them. And from that day on, because they said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And he said, I will not believe unless I put my fingers in the holes and the scars in his hands and my hand in his side. And from that day on, we know his name as Doubting Thomas. Right? So when you think of doubt, you think of Thomas. And of course, that's following Easter. That's, that's there. Poor Thomas, we've given him that name. You know, I told you last week that we were going to talk, what do you do with doubt? And uh, the first real significant doubt I remember, you know, we've got all kinds of doubts and different things, but in my life, when I really doubted the existence of God, I was wondering, God, are you really there? Was shortly after I'd become a Christian, which sounds so strange. Prior to becoming a Christian, I'd never really had any serious doubts about the existence of God. I'd been in a Bible study, and, and every now and then I would ask, what if God doesn't exist, you know, just to play devil's advocate? Because that's kind of the way I was, and unfortunately, maybe still am. But after becoming a Christian... I can remember, I worked in a grocery store, and I remember very distinctly, I was, I was stocking the dairy section. And I was praying, God, are you really there, or am I making a fool of myself? You see, I became a Christian just as I had started college. I didn't have a background in church. And I was attending, one of my classes was Western Civilization. Some of you have had that. My cousin Jenny said, Western Civilization is the class that colleges put there so that they can fail you and get your money more than once. That was her idea of Western Civilization. But in this Western Civ class, we were learning how the Hebrews created God. Okay? The evolution of religion. And I was reading my Bible now. And if what I was learning in this class was true, then the Bible wasn't true. And if the Bible was true, with what I was learning in this class wasn't true. And I had all kinds of questions. And I found out when you go to church and you ask church people these kind of questions, they go, <laughs> those are scary questions. A lot of them didn't want it. I found out it just wasn't a good place to ask questions. That's, well, I hope that isn't here. And if you've got questions... I hope you feel free to ask. But I found this wonderful resource I started. I was never much of a reader before I became a Christian. And I found out I had all these questions, and so people would recommend different books. And some of them are kind of heavy. There was some by Francis Schaeffer. He is there and he is not silent. And a lot of different, different books. And I encourage you, seek them out. They'll help you. But I thought, why at that time did I doubt the existence of God when I hadn't really before? You know, I've thought about it a lot since then. And I think the reason was this. Before, it didn't really matter to me. If God was there, he was there. 
If he wasn't there, he wasn't there. I wasn't counting on him for anything. I wasn't trying to live for God. He was just a thought out there. But now that I had said, Jesus, I want you to run my life. I want to follow you. I want to be your follower. Help me. And I'm praying and I'm reading. Now it matters. And if God wasn't really there, then indeed I was making a fool of myself. Let's look at that passage in John chapter 20, where Thomas gets this designation, Doubting Thomas. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now that makes perfect sense to me, doesn't it to you? I mean, a bunch of people come after the funeral and say, I just saw the person that was in the casket alive. You go, oh, that poor person. They are just racked with grief. They are out of their minds, right? I mean, that's what Thomas is saying. I saw him die. I was there. I know he's dead. He's not alive. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. That tells us several things. One is Jesus was aware of what was going on even though they didn't know he was present. So his physical presence wasn't there, but he was with them still. And he's saying, okay, Thomas, you said that? Okay, here's your chance. Go ahead. And what's Thomas's response? Verse 28. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. That's quite a proclamation. He is acknowledging the divinity of Christ. Verse 29. Then Jesus said to him, Behold, you have seen me and have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Wow. Doubt is different than unbelief. Doubt is to question. Unbelief is to deny. Understand that difference? See, Israel was chastised by God, condemned by God because of their unbelief. They had seen God move in many miracles, and they said, we don't trust him. You know, that, that wouldn't make you upset too, wouldn't it? I mean, if you're there for someone and they say, well, I don't trust you. And that's what Israel was doing. They had seen and it's not just that they, they had doubts. They had unbelief. They denied God. And there is a denial that is not doubt. It's rejection. Israel's belief was not trusting God, not trusting the God who had rescued them. Doubt is to have niggling questions, to wonder, to not be sure. Jesus had said to Capernaum, the people in Capernaum, it's uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. He says, and you, Capernaum, which was a town off the Sea of Galilee, not too far from Nazareth, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. That's another word for hell. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. In other words, he's saying to the people of Capernaum, you have seen what I'm doing and I'm here and you still reject me. If these kind of things would have been done in Sodom, the fire wouldn't have come down from heaven. They would have said, whoa. So there was that, that's, that's unbelief. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Not mainly anyway. What about us? who have not seen. <laughs> Blessed are those that have not seen and yet still believe, Jesus said. What do we do 
when we have doubt? Well, we think about doubt. We think of doubting Thomas. We think of Thomas, he comes to mind. But there's another person I want to talk to you about today who displayed doubt in Jesus. When we think of doubt, we don't normally think of the doubting John the Baptist. Right? John the Baptist, who makes these great proclamations about Jesus, the one who comes to prepare the way. John had doubt. So I want us today to look at his life and at the doubt he had and how Jesus responded and so that we can learn how we can respond when we too have doubt. First of all, let's look at John's faith. John had faith. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 through 17. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is so neat. I mean, John was baptizing a baptism of repentance. People, basically what is going, this is one of the rites that non-Jewish people would go through to become Jewish. So if you're Jewish and you're coming to John to be baptized, you're saying, I'm not, even, I'm not a good Jewish person. I'm not a good follower of God. I repent. I need to be baptized. I need to turn around. Jesus comes to John, and John says, whoa, you don't need to turn around. What are you doing here? If anyone needs to be baptized, I need to be baptized by you. That's quite a statement, isn't it? So we see that John recognized the righteousness of Jesus. More than that, then, when he baptizes them, he sees the Spirit alighting on Jesus. And he hears the word from heaven. And this is so neat. God says, this is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. He wants everyone to know he didn't need to repent. He identified with us in his baptism, but he didn't have any sin that he needed to repent. But John sees this, and he hears this, and he is, he is putting that faith in Christ. Look at John's testimony regarding this event. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Wow. There's more there. We'll get there in a minute. But... Jesus, he's saying of Jesus, he's going, he surpasses me. He came before me. Now, John and Jesus were cousins. If you go into Luke, it talks about Elizabeth and Zechariah having John, and Mary went to Elizabeth. So John was born before Jesus. But yet, John says here, he says, he comes after me, has surpassed me because he was before me. So Jesus, John is preaching. Jesus comes after him, but he was before him. How was he before him? He was still born after him because he is the incarnate God. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's making that proclamation. Verse 32. 
Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. Sounds pretty confident, doesn't he? That doesn't sound like doubt at all. He's standing up saying, Behold, look. And after this, some of his disciples went and followed Jesus. He said, This is the one I was talking about when I was talking about the one that was greater than me. And I know it's him now because I saw the Spirit rest upon him, just like God, who sent me to preach, had told me. That's pretty strong faith. Where's the doubt come in? Look at Matthew chapter 11. Verses 1 through 3. It says, After Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, look at the circumstances. John has been in prison because he told Herod that he shouldn't have married his brother's wife. And it made Herod upset. Herod didn't want to kill him because he recognized he was a man from God. But he imprisoned him. So John is in prison. He's not out and about. And he's hearing all these reports about Jesus. And he's got time to sit in his cell in this prison and think. You ever that? Where you just time to think? And sometimes you're your thoughts kind of like eat up on you. <laughs> and it's like you're laying in bed at night and you can't go to sleep because the hamster just won't get out of the wheel. And John is there. and he's, So what's he do? He sends his disciples. He can't go. He's in prison. He sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one? Now hold it. Before he went to prison, didn't he say, that's the one? Yes, he did. He had proclaimed it. He believed it. He proclaimed it. But now that he is shut away, now that he is not sure, am I going to get out of here or not? Am I, have I finished what God told me to do? He's got all of these doubts going around in his head. Now, we're not told about all of them, but you can figure it out. And he sends to Jesus and said, are you the one? Or should we expect someone else? That, friends, is doubt. He's doubting that Jesus is the Messiah. He's not sure. He's questioning. That had to have been a hard time for John in prison. But what's John do? John had sent his disciples. Look at verse 2 and 3. After Jesus, it's the same, same verses. But when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him. You see, when you have doubt, and doubt comes... We question things. We wonder, did I do that right? Did I say too much? Did I say too little? Should I have done that? God, am I at the place you want? There are all kinds of doubts. Some of them are little doubts and some of them big doubts, but there are all kinds of doubts. Am I supposed to go here or there? I don't know. And he's dealing with all of this. There's two different responses. There's John's response. He sent his disciples to ask Jesus. He sought information. There's another response that sometimes people have. Sometimes people use their doubts as an excuse. <gasps> I doubt whether or not God is real. Oh, good. I'm going to sit on that doubt because now I don't have to worry about how I live. I can do what I want because maybe there isn't a God and I can go do whatever I want to do. And now I have an excuse for my behavior because maybe there isn't a God. Maybe I'm not accountable. You see, that's not seeking more information. 
that's seeking to live in ignorance. That's not trying to confirm that the doubt is real, there is no God, but it's not trying to confirm it's not real either, that there is a God. It's living in that doubt. It's living with doubt, and that, my friends, becomes unbelief. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. So John sought out Jesus. Now, how would we do that if we have doubts? Well, it's exactly what I did in front of the dairy case in the grocery store. God, are you really there? Seeking answers. Looking to him for help. So how did Jesus react to John's doubt? And now we know how he reacted to, to Thomas's, right? Thomas, come on. Go ahead. Don't be faithless, but believing. My Lord and my God. You believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But how does Jesus react to John? Two things. First of all, he provided information. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So John sends, are you the one? And Jesus, it's interesting because Jesus doesn't say, yep, I'm the one, quit worrying, don't doubt. That would be easy, wouldn't it? I mean, it's like, yeah, he said, that's it, go ahead. And we know not too long after this, Herod's stepdaughter is dancing for the group, and he says, oh, you can have whatever you want. And his, her mother says, John the Baptist's head on a platter. So John was killed not too long after this. But at this point, Jesus says to the disciples, go. And he doesn't just say, yep, I'm the one. Instead, he gives evidence. Look at what you see. Tell John what you're seeing. And he's quoting all the things that the Messiah is going to do when he comes, which John knew about. It confirms John's faith. And then he goes on and says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. It's the same kind of thing that he said to Thomas. Thomas said, I won't believe in less. Jesus said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> he gave evidence so that Thomas could believe. And he gives evidence so that John the Baptist can believe. And then he gives encouragement. Blessed are you because you believe, Thomas. And he says to John the Baptist, blessed is, are those who don't stumble on account of me. It's good. Go ahead and believe. You see, God will help us work through our doubt when we take it to him. That doesn't mean it won't be a struggle. It doesn't mean it's going to be all done. But as we continue to look to him with a heart that's responsive to him, he will lead. And then, after giving some evidence to John, the disciples go back to tell John what Jesus has said. Jesus turns and talks to the crowd. So we see what, how does he feel about John? Is he upset because John had doubt? Is somehow John diminished in Jesus' eyes? Not at all. Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, that's kind of interesting, so they're probably hearing this as they're going, so they can report this to John too. But as the disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. 
Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. Verse 11. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there, is, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So what does Jesus do right after he affirms John's faith? He turns to the people and he praises John to the people in no uncertain terms. You want not to see a prophet? Oh, yes. Not just any prophet. This is the prophet who's preparing the way for the Messiah. In this, he's proclaiming himself to be Messiah. Sometimes people didn't catch that because Jesus didn't come out and say it. But it's clear. I'm the one that's coming. He's preparing the way. And among those born among women, among those born in the human race, until John, there hasn't been anybody greater. He is the greatest of all the prophets, what Jesus is saying. And this is in the midst of John's doubt. So friends, when you've got doubt, don't think God is upset with you when you come to him with your doubts. Lord, I don't understand this. Lord, I don't know about it. How can that be? How can this be? And we have all of these questions. Norm and I talk about some of them sometimes. You know, how can this be? We don't know, and we don't have all the answers, and we're trying to work it. But when we take it to the Lord, he is not displeased with us. He is at the opposite. He is pleased because we can go to him. And he says, among those born among women, there's none greater than John. He's the greatest of all the prophets. But yet those that are part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that be every believer, are greater than him. So why is it that people reject Jesus? Oh, there's lots of reasons, I'm sure. But I want to talk about three reasons for unbelief. And unbelief, again, I'm saying, is not doubt. It's those that reject Jesus. The first reason is ignorance. Now, <laughs> ignorance isn't the same thing as stupidity, right? You can be ignorant and not stupid. You can be stupid and ignorant, too. My son likes to say there's no cure for stupidity. He's usually talking about guys he's working with. But ignorance is not knowing. I don't know. We talked a couple weeks ago, how can they believe in one they have not heard? And how can they hear if they haven't been sent? Oh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We need to carry the good news. Some people don't believe because they just don't have any information. It's not so much in belief. It's just haven't, they haven't experienced it yet. They wonder. Now there's all kinds of levels there. And God works in people's hearts before all around the world. And that's some of the questions we don't know. But there's ignorance. But there's a problem. Sometimes it's what's referred to as willful ignorance. It's like the guy sitting in a restaurant said to the other person, you know, the problem with this world is ignorance and apathy. And the other person looks at him and says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> Sometimes ignorance is on purpose. I don't know and I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Remember the Three Stooges? Some of you younger people probably don't. But you can remember Curly going, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see. And Mo says, Why? I got my eyes closed. Sometimes we don't see because we don't want to see. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. He says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness, godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. 
For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they, never, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking they became fu- but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened although they claimed to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal god for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles in other words they created idols they created god after their own image it was like i was talking about the hebrews creating god that's this I don't want to be responsible to anyone. Therefore, I will do this. It's the idea of there's truth out there. Ah, there can't be truth. It might be true for you, but it's not true for me. Oh, that's fine. That's your truth. This denial of absolute truth is part of all of this. It is willful ignorance now it's one thing to be have doubts God I don't know Jesus did you really live did you die did you rise from the dead are these things true as Paul would go into different villages throughout uh, Asia Minor and Greece the different people sometimes they listen sometimes they wouldn't but we're told about the Bereans since they were more noble than those in Thessalonica and others because they Search the word to see whether these things were true. The things Paul's saying, were they predicted? They sought information. So if you've got doubts, don't worry about that. It's okay. It's not fun to have doubts. But actively pursue those doubts. I tell people, you know, you don't want to make a decision for Christ if you don't have the information that you need. Jesus himself said that. Consider the cost. Talk, think it through. So I tell people what that is, this means it's a front burner issue, not a back burner issue. You know what I mean when I say you do some cooking? You know? What's actively working on is in front, right? What's sitting back simmering is back here. There's some issues, they're not resolved. They're, they're not finally cooked yet. We're working on them still, but they're back burner issues. They're not ending right now. We don't have to deal with them. Well, what you do with Jesus is a front burner issue. Keep it on the front burner. Keep it in front of you. Work on it until you come to resolution. Second reason I find that people reject Jesus is very similar to willful ignorance, but a little different. It's, it's morality. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 3. This is right after he says, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 19, it says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Remember I told you the story about salvation. The good news is that we're, the bad news is we're all drowning. Our ship is sunk and we're treading water in the middle of an ocean because we've all sinned and we've disobeyed God. But the good news is Jesus comes along and he says, take my hand. He's our savior. I will rescue you. There are some people saying, I, I don't know where are you going? They don't want to get in the boat with Jesus because they're not sure they want to go there, which is really silly when you think about it because the alternative is to drown. But that's the idea here. Years ago, I had a young couple in my office that were getting married, and I had a chance. I was talking to them about following Jesus and how we've all sinned, and the penalty of sin is death, but that God came, became flesh, lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin, to offer eternal life to whoever who would respond to him. And I asked them, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? And the young lady said, yes. 
here, but I got a question. If I ask Jesus to be my savior, can I still smoke marijuana? She, she wasn't laughing about it. She was serious. It was a big part of her life. I don't think she called it marijuana, but you know. Can I still get high? And I thought, ooh, help me, Lord. Because if I say no, then it's going to say, oh, you, you, way do you get to heaven is don't smoke marijuana. That's not true. A lot of people that don't smoke marijuana that haven't given their lives to Christ. I don't want her to think you get to heaven by how good you are because that's to undo everything I just talked about. But how do I answer this in a way that's going to be true to the gospel? So I asked her a question. I said, let me ask you a question. If you give your life to Christ and say, I'm going to follow you, will you follow him if he says, don't smoke marijuana? And she looked at the floor and she said, no. She wasn't willing to follow Jesus if that meant not smoking marijuana. Now, we can put that on all kinds of things. But the issue is this. If for some silly reason, maybe your mother taught you some really strange things. Hi, Mom. <laughs> like, oh, you should never wear brown socks to church. Okay, so you grow up believing you should never wear brown socks to church. But you like brown socks. And you want to wear brown socks. So you decide, I'm going to wear brown socks to church. You know what that's called? Sin. Why? Because it's wrong to wear brown socks to church? As far as I know. But if you're convinced in your heart that it's wrong and you do it anyway, what you're saying is, God, I don't care what you want. I'm going to do my own thing. That's a problem. It's a problem of the heart. And Jesus said, many people don't come to follow me because if they come to me, I'm, I'm in the light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If you, if you walk in darkness and say you're following him, you're lying and aren't doing the truth. But if you walk with him, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. You have fellowship with one another. So we come into the light and we see. See, when you come into the light... You find out, ooh, there was a lot more wrong with me than I thought was wrong. But the good news is Jesus receives us, forgives us, and helps us. He loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us where we're at. So ask yourself, if you haven't, haven't decided to follow Christ, is it, is it because you just didn't know until now? Or it's because you really didn't want to? And then there's a third reason that we see in the scriptures. There's a predominant reason that people don't follow God, that don't follow Christ. Pride. We see this among this group that were called Pharisees. Pharisees were a very, they were the evangelicals of the Jewish world at that time. They were very conservative. They, they were God followers. They were, they were righteous and they were proud of it. And I, I've said sometimes, you know, Quakers... We're noted for our humility, and we're really proud of it. Pride is a funny thing. Pride says, well, I'm better than he is. I don't need to go. It's like Jesus said, there was two people standing before God. There was a tax collector who was collaborating with Rome and hanging out with Gentiles and taking money, you know, stealing. And there was a Pharisee, and the Pharisee stood and said, Lord, I'm thankful that I'm not like that sinner. And the sinner wouldn't look up to heaven and said, Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus said, that man went home justified, not the first, because he's the one that asked for help. He humbled himself. Listen, when you take Jesus' yoke, it means you have to bend your neck to his yoke. It means you have to submit your life to him. And sometimes people say, no. And I can remember after I heard the gospel, I wanted to be a Christian. I tried to reform my life. But I hadn't really given the keys of my life to Jesus. 
And after a period of time, a couple of months of trying to live right, I thought, God, this isn't much fun. I don't like this. And I remember telling God, just before I responded to the gospel, God, leave me alone. I want to do what I want to do the way I want to do it when I want to do it. I don't want to have to worry about you. And that's a part of pride. Jesus said, John 5, 39 and 40, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. He's talking to the Pharisees. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. See, if you don't know you have an issue, if you don't feel you need to be forgiven, you don't seek forgiveness. So the first place we all need to be is understand that we have a need. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has turned away from God. And we know that in our hearts. Don't let pride keep you from following Jesus. So what's your response to doubt? Are you going to use it as an excuse so that you would be disobedient? Listen, you can always go to Jesus. Jesus said, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I still have doubts. I, I think probably the person that doesn't have any doubts is maybe a person that quit thinking. I don't know. Maybe that's just my excuse because I still have doubts. I've got all kinds of doubts. And niggling ones, sometimes some big ones pop into my head. But here's the difference. I used to pay attention to my doubts and downplay my faith. I am now in a place in my life where I acknowledge my faith and downplay my doubts. Doubts just aren't that big of an issue for me. I've worked through a whole lot of issues. I've come to satisfactory answers, not full answers, but enough that I'm, I'm convinced I'm okay. And I believe without a doubt that Jesus loves us, loves me, and gave his life for me. I want to follow him. I invite you to make that journey with me also. So don't worry. If you've got questions, if you've got doubts, don't worry about it. God can handle your questions. I might not be able to, but he can. When you have doubts, don't run from God. When you have doubts, run to God, and He will meet you there. Would you stand with me, please? Lord Jesus, you know every one of us. You know where we've been, what we went through, the things we've heard, the injuries we've sustained, the questions that we have. You know our hearts. And Lord, thank you. You love each and every one. We pray that you draw each one to you, that you help us to deal with our doubts in the way John the Baptist did, with integrity to seek you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us. Like, like the one father said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help us as we struggle through this life. Lord, for anyone who's listening to this or anyone that's here that has not yet given their lives to you, we pray that your spirit would draw them to you and that they might make a decision to commit their lives to you and that you might fill them with your love and your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. As we move into this last song, I just want to give an opportunity. If you're here this morning and you're saying, you know, I have not committed my life to Christ. I want to do that. There's something about proclaiming that publicly that's important. So I would just encourage you to come and, and meet at the front here if that's you because that's, that's humbling yourself. It's hard. You know, it's not one of these things, all eyes closed, heads bowed. No, everybody looking. Come right out and say, I want to follow Jesus. I encourage you to do that. If you're watching online now or sometime in the future, 
pray that you'd reach out to someone and you'd let them know, I have made a decision to follow Jesus. He's my Savior. Pray it, but then also make that decision. And while the, the band is leading us in worship, if, that, if God's speaking to your heart and you need to do that, please come forward. Not going to be a long altar call. That's the altar call. But respond to Jesus. And if you've got questions, <laughs> doubts, you've got questions, uh, there's none of us here that haven't had. So go ahead, talk to me, talk to someone else. God will meet you.